Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Multifamily Investing with uh, Charles Dobbins, the multifamily attorney. Uh, I have a very special guest here today, and this woman is, is pretty impressive. Um, so her name is, is Ellie Perlman. Now, Ellie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, go through your bio here that, that they've asked me to read, and, um, uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of like interject some thoughts as I go through it, okay? Uh, like, go for it. All right. So uh, she's a founder and CEO of Blue Lake Capital, a real estate investing firm specializing in multifamily investments. Um, she, uh, she started her career as a commercial real estate uh, lawyer. Now, also, she went to law school in Israel. Okay, so I got to ask you, like, do they like teach English common law in Israel? Like, what do you guys learn there? How does it work? Um, we learn what people learn, you know, here at law school. We just uh, learn how to become lawyers in Israel. This is where I'm from. Uh, and that was my, you know, the country where I was born and raised. And uh, the initial plan was to become a lawyer and just live there and live my life and practice law. And that's, you know, it's, it's not very different than what's happening here in law school. All right. All right. All right. Cool. So now uh, commercial real estate attorney, she's a leading, com she's a uh, leading commercial real estate transactions for Israel's largest developer. She also got then on the property management side. That's when she started to get her hands really dirty. Uh, and she over, she's overseen properties worth over a hundred million dollars. Um, she has her MBA from uh, MIT. So she's, you know, she's a Boston girl. We'll, we'll welcome her into the fold. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think one of the pictures in the background, I, I was trying to think, is that New York or could that be Boston uh, with the, with the <laughs> backdrop? I thought that looks more like, like Cambridge than it does New York. Um, so, but here's the thing. And this is, a, this is the cool part. And this is what we're going to talk about today. She's got a, um, uh, a podcast that I recommend everybody, uh, everybody favored on their, uh, on their uh, podcast service. Uh, that really happened, uh, where it was just a play on her name, Ellie, and it's all about unbelievable real estate stories. So uh, in addition to talking, talking us today about raising capital and syndicating deals, I think Ellie and I can play a game called, Oh yeah, where she tells me an unbelievable story and I say, oh yeah, well I can top that one, watch this. So welcome Ellie to my podcast. Thank you so much, I'm really happy to be here today. Now where are you physically right now? Right now I'm in Santa Monica, California. Oh, good for you, oh yeah. wow. Let me find the, the part of your bio that really kind of hit me. Uh, you know, you grew up poor in Israel. All right. Um, you know, there are poor people in Israel. So, and you had a teen marriage, um, you know, and then, and then this thing about the mysterious disease that left you almost blind. I got to tell you that, that almost happened to a member of my family as well. Mm. So when I read that, like, Ooh, geez, but then you decided to change your life and you kind of like took control. You, took, you know, it seems like you took control back. You got your bachelor's, you went and got your, your master's in law. Um, in three and a half years, you moved to the U.S., you know, went to MIT um, for your MBA, uh, and then you've just been, you've been killing it since then. So, bro, I'm, I just want to give you a little applause there. Bravo Thank to you. you. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Good for you. Good for you. So, tell us about the journey. Um, well, I actually, I'm not sure where exactly to, to begin um, I think the journey is, there are always two journeys. There's the real actual journey where you're physically, it, where you are physically and what, you know, where you're born to what reality and, and all the physical things that, that are happening to you. But then there's the reality that you create and you create a certain reality where you can either be a victim yeah. and, you know, say, Hey, you know, I'm, I was born to a certain family. I was born to that reality and I see successful people around me and I'm never going to be one of them because right. I don't have money. I don't have connections. Um, and that's one reality. Or you can leave a reality where you say, wait a minute, if they can do it, I can do it. I'm not different than, than all those other people. And if anything that actually gave me, um, you know, I had this, this fire in me because I was born a certain way I was determined not to live those lives, the, the same life, the life that I, you know, used to have and the life that my brothers and sisters used to have. So um, that, that was a major, I think that's one of the things that actually pushed me 
to go faster and go higher than anyone that I've that I've known. And I was born to a, a poor family, but um, I, when I was 11, I was cleaning synagogues and and you know to make money to help my parents. And I knew I could do better. And you know, do you think yeah. it's like a level of confidence that you were born with or, or you know, because I think about it, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, uh, where you get to a certain point where you see how other people are living, other successful people are living, and you think, hey, why not me? But I think to myself, there was a time in my life when I just lacked the confidence to think that way. That's an excellent point. Um, I think part of it was my parents, they couldn't give me anything monetary, um, but they instilled this feeling in me that I can do whatever I want and I can be whomever I want. And I believed in that. And when I believe in that, because I believed in that, I actually went ahead and did it. Now, I have to tell you, and I had this conversation today with someone, with one of my employees. Many people told me I, I can't. I couldn't. They they told me, ah, you know, you know, and I got. I, I'm gonna tell us a little story here. Um, I needed to go to. I I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. I thought that would be my way out of the, you know, that, you know, out of being poor and I'll be able to make money. And I knew I needed a certain score to get into um to be admitted to law school because i wanted to go to a good law school not just to any law school mm -hmm. and uh i remember i was standing there and i was so afraid of the the uh results from the the exams came back and i was i couldn't open it because i was so nervous and i was married back then i got married when i was 19 i thought that was a good idea back then uh because who doesn't want to get married when they're 19 right um and uh, and I gave it to my ex-husband. Oh, you, of course. Yeah, well, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I was by myself. How could I get married? You know? Jeez. Um, but I gave I gave the envelope to my ex-husband. I was sitting outside of the post office, and I said, "I'm so nervous. I don't. Can you please tell me what what what's the number?" And and because I knew I needed to hit a certain number, and I worked really hard. It took me about two years. Um, to, to, or a year to study and to, you know, get the, 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 you know, take the exam. And I remember he was opening the piece of paper, looking at the results, looking at me, looking at the results, oh. looking at me. Oh, he's killing. Oh, oh, come and on. Saying, hey, give her the answer. And saying, you're never going to be a lawyer. Really? Yes. Yeah. That, that's, the, and then you, you, know, you use that as grounds for divorce. <laughs> You know, it took me about five or six more years, but it, it um, <laughs> I looked at him and I said, oh, just, I said, oh, just watch me. Good for you. And I worked even harder to improve that, that score. And I got, not only I got in, I got in on a scholarship and I, I um, actually, I graduated in three and a half years with both masters, with both bachelor and masters in law. And then I graduated with honors. Good for you. That's awesome. So, you and know, then people told me I couldn't get into MIT and I said, Oh, watch me. So, you know, it's, it's part of it is your question is, is a state of mind of I can do it. But even when other people are telling you, Oh, you probably can't, it's a stretch or, you know, for me, it just, it excites me because now it's a challenge. Now it's something I need to I conquer. You can do it. Now you know you can yeah. do it. And for those people sitting at home that don't understand MIT is for school is for uh, students that uh, can't get into Boston college. <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's what I mean. and uh, just so you know, I, um, I, uh, I, I had a similar experience when I got the, the uh, letter of whether I passed the bar or not. And, um, but the thing is here in Massachusetts, also known of among lawyers as Massachusetts, um, because it's the easiest <laughs> bar exam in the country. Um, it is, uh, it's a thin envelope. If you get a thin envelope, you passed. If you get a big manila folder, like with an application mm. for next time, then you know you lost. So I like to, and remember, Ellie, it's all about marketing. This business is all about marketing. Everything's all about marketing. So I tell people that I received the highest bar passing score in the history of the Massachusetts bar exam. That's very nice. Yeah, That's it's, very it's, impressive. It's a pass fail test. I don't tell them. <laughs> No, no, I know that's like that. very very nice. <laughs> yes, exactly. And as far as scholarships goes, no, I never got a scholarship to anything. But my all of my children have received a a full ride scholarship to all of the colleges of their choice 
Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's called the Charles Dobbins Memorial Scholarship Fund. And uh, it's going to kill me. That's why we call it a memorial <laughs> fund. Putting these kids through college is going to kill me. So, yeah. I was, yeah. I, was I, well, I don't know who if I should be impressed by your kids or by you for having that fund. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, it comes in every week. It just appears. Yeah. Uh, some people call it a savings account. I don't, I don't know. I, we call it a, tr a trust fund, my children's trust fund. So, but that's, that's fantastic. And I totally know where you're coming from. And I, and I honestly, I think think you nailed it and it has so much to do with how you were raised and the parents and the mindset they give you my father was an orphan uh grew up no parents and made you know a, a rags to riches story and he always mm. said you can do whatever you want you just got to set your mind to it and that had that is so huge that's a it's a you know think about those those kids that just don't get that opportunity you know and then, you know it's it's you're you're a product of your reaction to your environment not a product of your environment and exactly. it's all yeah it's all what you do with it so that's exactly great. just think how, how exciting it is if you actually can do it how exciting that would be yeah. i mean not pursuing that for me that's harder than trying and get what i want to get yeah. And I left, I, I mean, when I moved to California after I graduated um, from MIT, I was actually, I got a very, very nice, you know, six figure job, very comfortable at a tech company here. And um, it's just, and I'm having those conversations with my other friends and they're saying, you know what, I've just had a conversation the other week with a friend of mine that said, ah, I got an offer from another company we're not going to name because everybody knows. Uh, and I said, oh, how much was your offer? And she said, ah, 400K. I don't know. I don't think I'm going to go because it's just boring. And, it, and, and that's it. It's a, at some point, it, you know, it stops being about the money and more about the excitement of what you can do if you push back, you know, and that was hard to push the, the very nice salary, you know, arriving at 10, leaving at 304, everything yeah. is moving very slow, you know, in California, it's, it's not, not that it moves slow, but it's, there's not much pressure. Yeah. Yeah. And then I do this with, oh, with a lot more pressure and, uh, start when I started, I, you know, I didn't make any money. Okay. So tell us what, what you did. So uh, you came here, you, you obviously were in, in Cambridge for a while and yeah. then, and then did you, I, I'm under the impression, was there a New York stop in there somewhere along the way or did you go straight, um, straight to California? No, I actually, I, um, I actually moved uh, summer or March 2014. I moved from Israel to, um, to Massachusetts. Okay. Um, but six months later, started you know school, and then, and then moved away from the cold to back to, uh, you know, to California. Yeah, I can't blame you. Okay, I, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm here in New Hampshire <laughs> right now, and uh, you know, I have a house in Duxbury. I, I have a place up here in New Hampshire. But I'm telling you, empty nester, I'm done. Uh, as soon as I hit this time, next time a snowstorm's on its way, I'm South Carolina. Uh, that's where I'm headed. So, so uh, I'm I'm so through with uh, the weather out here. I'm done. So, bravo yeah. for, for making that decision. Now, um, okay, so you got out to Santa Monica. Tell me, but you had your real estate experience over in Israel, mm -hmm. and now you came over here to to you know you got your MBA. And then you went over to California. When did the the real estate bug hit you out there in California? And how did that all happen? Um, good question. I was actually, you know, I was very involved in real estate when I was in Massachusetts, took, you know, real estate classes, okay, okay. underwriting classes. And I was known as a real estate girl. Um, hmm. and, um, when I moved here, Initially, I was in tech for a little bit, and then I came. For me, it was coming back to real estate because I was a lawyer, I was property manager, and then just the investment side was kind of the last piece that glued everything together. Um, my husband and I were, and we still we still invest um, as passive investors in other you know companies, you know other syndicators deals. Yeah, and um, that that was a good start for me because. I understood which markets I liked and the fact that I actually liked to syndicate deals. And then I made the switch from, you know, the tech world where, you know, I, I actually take the experience that I had working for a tech company and helping them build the business and my education at MIT. And I use that and my experience in real estate to build a company, you know, to actually build Blue Lake Capital. Okay. 
All right, so let's talk about the building of this business. First off, what markets do you like? Where, where are you invested in? So I'm invested primarily in Texas and Florida. Okay. Um, we're also looking into uh, Georgia as well. So Santa Monica and Southern California is a great place to live in. It's a terrible place to buy anything. So. It is a terrible place to buy anything, not <laughs> only because of the laws and everything, but I've been, you know, I, I analyze my students' deals. They send me their, their, uh, their cash flow analysis. They, uh, you know, we look at the offering memorandums. And Ellie, it is so bad in Southern California that the brokers are putting on the their, their property, their offering memorandums, um, that you have to put 50% down to make the numbers work. Just to even to get, get the debt coverage ratio at like 1.3, yeah. you got to put 50% down. That is how stupid the prices mm -hmm. are out there in, in uh, Southern California. Not it's to mention rent control. Oh, Oh yeah. Don't, you know, get me, don't get me started oh, with rent control. Well, you know what they say, there are two ways to destroy a city, uh, strafe bombing or rent, rent control. So <laughs> you know, it, yeah, it, it is. It's just, if anyone questions this, go on YouTube, do a search on Marvin, uh, on, um, um, uh, oh, oh, who's the, who's the economist from, the, I just mentioned his name, the economist, University of Chicago, Milton Friedman. Do mm -hmm. a search on Milton Friedman rent control and just watch his little video on rent control. You will understand the economics of rent control, and it's it's atrocious. It's going to destroy it destroys cities. Look at uh, look at um, oh well, now New York has kind of survived well, but I think New York has, has survived well in spite of itself. Uh, it's just a, a great real estate market, but rent control can destroy a city faster uh, than you can imagine, faster than sex offenders. So. <laughs> Yeah. Don't ask me about that one. So, um, all right. So, so you, you're in those markets and now are you, are you a sponsor? Are you leading the deal? Are you, are you the, um, the syndicator on the, these deals? Uh, or were you just being the passive investor in some of these deals or both obviously? So right now our focus is, uh, to be actually the lead sponsor. Okay. So okay. we find, we source deals, we find them, we partner, you know, also with, um, with other companies. Sometimes it will be a JV, um, on the capital side and then, you know, manage the deals as well. Okay. Now what type of deals do you look for? Um, so usually hundred units and above anything that is a good candidate for, for a value add. So when I say value add, I mean, you know, anything that if you can put some love and attention into that property, you can actually convince people that it's worthwhile to pay a little bit extra for the units, for the rents. So um, renovating units, renovating or adding amenities, and then increasing rents, usually, you know, $150, $200 a month. Yeah. Um, these are the type of, of properties that we're looking into. And we're usually in, in secondary markets in those markets. So I'm not going to look into properties in downtown of, you know, um, of Dallas. Austin, because Dallas, yeah. Austin. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're still going to be in the DFW market, but a bit, you know, further away from where all the action is happening, where you can actually have higher returns. All right. So like how far out? So when you say secondary, are we talking Mesquite or is, is Mesquite like too close to, you know, Dallas, Fort Worth or, you know, um, what's a town that's uh, like between Austin and, uh, and, and Dallas. I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. Like, are you that far outside yeah. from secondary markets? Okay. So my rule, so I have a rule of thumb, which is no more than 45 minute drive from, from downtown. And I, I have this rule because I think many people that many people are working in the downtown areas or, you know, in that strong markets, but they cannot afford to live there. So they'll be able to commute. And of course, up to 30 minutes is ideal. A little bit more than that. It, it depends on the market and, and the deal itself. Yeah. Especially where we are right now in the cycle, I think that those markets are going to be, they're going to be less affected, or I hope they're going to be less affected than markets that are, you know, kind of in the middle of nowhere where you see great returns, but they're two hour, three hour drive from major, you know, metro, you know, the metropolis. I just, I don't think that, I don't know how they're going to behave um, when there's going to be a shift. So I'd rather stay close to, to the center. You know, I describe when I'm teaching uh, my class, uh, people need a definition of 
uh, the difference between the primary, secondary, and tertiary markets. So I said, well, I'm a pilot. So I, I, I liken it to uh, the, the airports. Uh, primary market is one that has an international airport. Secondary mm -hmm. market is one that has a regional airport. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, the tertiary markets are the ones that have a non-towered field where the pilots are just flying around talking to each other. That's, that's the difference. <laughs> so wait a minute, I have, to, I, have to, I have to boast. And I'm going to tell you a little funny story about this. So can you see it? This is my... This oh, is, yeah. Yeah, that's going to be my plane, okay? So I'm in the process of buying this plane, and I, and I um, uh, buy a, a, a fractional share, 50% share in this plane, and I'm talking to the guy that uh, that's selling it to me, and I said, you know, I said, let me just, I suppose I shouldn't tell you this, but uh, because I, I do real estate negotiation all day long, and I know how to negotiate deals. I know what to say, what not to say, when to say it. I said, so I probably shouldn't tell you before we start negotiating the price here that I've already put a picture of this plane on my wallpaper on my computer. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it, totally it. Got me. <laughs> what do you think about what's going on in this market right now? What do I think about what's going on in the market? Um, I can tell you, well, I'm not very educated when it comes to office and retail. Right, I right. can't talk about that. I can tell you from a multifamily point of view. Yeah, that's all I want to hear. Yeah. So I think, I don't know if we're at the peak of the market. It's always, you know, hindsight, hindsight. Um, I see a lot of deals, most deals actually that are traded above what they should be, you know, yeah. traded. So a lot of, um, investors are overpaying for deals. Yeah. And that's the main issue. So even though you see a slowdown in when it comes to financing, when, you know, when it comes to, you know, increasing interest rates. And then on the other hand, um, you see rent is still growing, but at a smaller pace, you see slowdown, a slowdown in rent growth, then it should have led to, you know, a decrease in prices, but that didn't really happen. So what I see is that I see fewer um, buyers in each deal, but the prices are still there. So what happened in my opinion is that some buyers and I see it around me decided either to stop buying multifamily altogether or in extreme cases get out of real estate but also um but those who stay didn't really change their course of action so they're still willing to overpay and right now it seems like everyone is doing great there's still rent growth the returns we're still on track but I'm worried what's going to happen a year from now six one from, months from now, two years from now. So if you're not conservative and if you're not sticking to your criteria and to your underwriting assumptions, then you might be doing well now, but fast forward several months from now, things are going to change. And I think we're going to see that, I don't know when, but we're probably going to see it soon. Yeah, uh, listen, I could not agree with you more on, on, on almost everything you said. And let me just add a little color to it. Um, the, the, getting back to the discussion of markets, I wouldn't touch a primary market in a million years. The numbers just don't make sense. I think a lot of this, there is a, so much money sitting on the sidelines looking for a place to be employed right. that they're willing to overpay because they've got to put that money to work and they think the rents are just going to continue to go up mm -hmm. and therefore it's going to justify the price. And that is, that's a recipe for disaster. I've already lived through that cycle once. And then, and then, uh, the secondary and the tertiary markets are where the deals are going to, going to be had because you're not necessarily dealing with these big, deep pocket institutional investors. You're dealing with people who still have to, you know, they can't overpay for property. And I teach all my students, and the biggest mistake you can make in this business is overpaying for property. You might as well just exactly. go drop, drop your keys on the bank's desk and walk away because you're mm -hmm. not going to make it back. Um, there's a particular guru out there that says you can overpay for multifamily property because the prices will just continue to go up. And I got to tell you something, Ellie, that guy bet has, should be about eight years old because I used to own property and that price never came back. And I had to give it back to the bank when it was all said and done because the crash brought, brought the values down so much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you are absolutely right. And, and I, I do think that there are going to be opportunities out in the secondary and the tertiary market. They're still going to exist there. But, and once again, you know, these big in institutional investors are going to take a bath and we're going to have to be bailing these guys out. Uh, you yeah. know, when, when they, when they, you know, too big to fail situations. So, yeah, I, it, yeah. You know, I I really appreciate you you saying that. Um, I don't think I got a straight answer from the last guy. 
but this is, I think you're, you're, you're telling it like it is, uh, that this is what's going on. Yeah, and I keep telling my investors, you know, I have investors that want to invest and they have money. They're sitting on a lot of money. Like, you know, there's a lot of money chasing deals. And I tell them, don't be tempted. Just wait for the right opportunity. It's yeah. better if right now your money's going to make, I don't know, a single digit percent, you know, uh, interest rate until in a few months you're going to find the right deal. Then, you know, you're, you're kind of, you, ha you have this, um, in internal pressure to deploy the money in a deal that will make you even less. And I'm yeah. not sure, you know, you might be even losing that money. So, um, but I'm, you know, I'm, because I, I was a lawyer, I'm very conservative. And I read somewhere that if someone has two degrees, the initial education that they get is what shapes their work, their, the way they view the world. And it was done with doctors that are, that also studied law and they saw that there's a difference in how they approach situations, whether law was their first degree or the, the first, you know, education or actually medicine. So the doctor, the, those who went to medicine, to, to med school was, to medical school was basically, they were focused on, on the, um, you know, on, uh, on the patient and only at secondary, they were concerned about the legal implications of doing things the right way and with, those who were lawyers first, it all changed. So that's why, you know, I see, I see investment and I see it in a different way. Listen, I play with my money and I invest in, in riskier, you know, investments as an angel investor, but I, I know some that most odds, some of my money, not all of it, a right. small portion, but I know that most odds, I'm not going to see the money again and I'm right. fine. With it. But when it comes to bringing other investors on board and, and, having their money, then I'm extremely conservative Yeah, because I don't, I don't want to lose anybody's money and, and I want to hit the returns that, you know, we projected and that's, that's not easy to do. So you, you know, know, gotta buy right. It's so interesting. I gotta tell you, it's so great talking to another lawyer because, because I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Sometimes I think my students don't appreciate the advice I'm giving them because I'm too conservative. I don't want to see them lose. I don't want to see them get screwed. I mean, I, listen, um, you know, as uh, in my own business world, I don't want any problems. I just don't, I'm too old. I'm 72 years old, Ellie. You're I, I, 72? Yeah, how good do I like, huh? <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay. That's the only way I get compliments. Okay. So, um, no, but it, I just don't want problems. So, yeah. you know, and I don't want to see my students get screwed. I've already made all the mistakes for them, so they don't need to do it again. So, you know, let them uh, follow my lead and I'll protect them every step of the way. But yeah, it's just take it slow, be patient. And the other thing that, that uh, you have to take into consideration is, you know, we're in a business and every business has to sell a product and every product has to be sold to a customer. At some point, we're going to run out of those customers that can afford to pay $2,500 for a studio in, yeah. in Seaport District of Boston. And before you know it, those, those places are going to become vacant or they're going to drop their rents and it's going to be a trickle down effect to everybody else. So that's why you got to be careful in those markets where we, we will ultimately run out of customers. We did during the last crash when uh, you know, we ran out of people to sell homes to, and, and you know, it's all gonna come back to haunt us. So just be, you gotta be conservative, be very patient. So yeah, and I, exactly. and I appreciate you, um, uh, you know, telling me how good I look for 72 years old. <laughs> so. My pleasure. Thank you. So, so what is, you know, how is that impacting your investing right now? You know, having that in the back of the mind, being conservative, what are you, what are you saying to, you know, when you go find a deal, mm -hmm. find that right deal and you're thinking, okay, how is this going to be impacted by a potential down, downturn? What do you do? Yeah. So uh, great question. Um, I actually instructed my underwriting team, acquisitions team to be very pessimistic when it comes to um, the exit strategy. So um, that's, that's one way of doing it. So for instance, I, you know, we're always, I'm always assuming that when I would want to sell the property in three, five, seven years, the market is not going to be as strong as it is now. And I think it's pretty reasonable to assume. And if I'm mistaken and the market is going to be as strong, Hey, more power to me. Right. Then it means yeah. that we're, we're getting beautiful returns, but 
I'm assuming that cap rates are actually going to increase. Yeah. And that's so if I buy a deal at a five cap, um, and I basically assume on all of our underwritings, we assume that when we exit, the cap rates are actually going to be higher. So yeah. we're conservative because it means lower cap rates, higher, higher prices. So higher cap rates, lower prices. So how much, what what's your conservative underwriting? Are you going up by, I mean, I, we go up by a quarter percent anyway, just because the property ages over that seven year period. But mm -hmm. what do you do in your underwriting for your exit cap? So we're doing 10 basis points um, per year. So if I buy it at a five cap, it's going to be five and a half cap on the exit, wow. which is very, it's very, it's pretty much, you know, it's very conservative. Um, in addition, I'm looking at the rent growth and I'm looking at the historic rent growth and um, also the projections. And if right now, for instance, Orlando is a very strong market, they have around six to 7% organic growth, which means, not even renovating, just just keep increasing rents on the turn as you know new tenants come in six to seven percent. We're gonna underwrite three to four percent. So if you put six percent, because you're gonna say, "Hey, market is doing great," is it sustainable for five years? Probably not. So it's gonna slow down. Um, so that's you know how we adjust. We're basically being we say, "Hey, things are going to change." And they're not going to be as good as they are now. So what do we think is going to happen with the rent growth, with the exit? Because it's a bit easier to project the expenses because you know how much it's going to cost you to operate the building. And of course, you have some extras on the side um, for reserves. But just understanding that in every deal, every deal on the planet can work if, if you're being very aggressive on the assumptions but we assume almost not the worst but we assume a worse you know market and if the deal still works then it's a solid deal all right let me do the first first uh, um our first entree into the game oh yeah um so you talk about expenses being uh you know manageable or or, or you can figure them out very easily all right so listen to this what happened to me so i own a property in lexington kentucky and uh lexington kentucky as a town as a city had an unfunded pension liability issue among the, the city employees so the mayor gets up there and he, and he says i'm going to solve this problem so what he did was he went out and he sold the water and sewer company to a Jew, German company. And they came in there and overnight they split the two up. We then started to receive two separate bills, one for water, one for sewer, with a 35% increase. And, and we, uh, there goes the profit. We, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't increase rents fast enough to make up for that increase in the cost. Six months later, there's, a, there's an op-ed uh, letter uh, in the Wall Street Journal from the mayor of, of, uh, of Lexington, Kentucky, talking about how he solved the unfunded pension liability problem by selling off these, these uh, city assets. Who do you think paid for the unfunded pension liability? I did. I'm the one that was everyone else out of the water bills. So, you know, there's an example of, of yes, many of these expenses are, you can, you know, can set your clock to them but you never see that type of thing coming down the pike. Yeah. You can't even budget for it. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's why you need to have, you know, enough reserves for all yeah. those unexpected things because real estate is such an unexpected, you know, industry. There's so many things you cannot foresee and things you can't even imagine. Um, but also, you know, on the flip side, good things as well. You know, those also happen. So, you know, I've seen deals where, the owner renovated all the units and, but never raised rents because he just wanted to keep the property hundred percent occupied. So you see all those deals and say, Whoa, uh, let me take that property, you know, away from me. And I, how much do you want? That's a reasonable price. I'll take care of the rent increases. And the, but you know, you're going to evict everybody, you know, because they're not going to be able to afford a two hundred dollar a month rent rent increase. You know, unless, unless you know. It, um. It on well, I, I'm not evicting them, but yeah, once once they. Um, oh right, not evicting them, but they're all gonna. You're gonna. Yeah, move. they're gonna leave, and then we're gonna bring you know, and we basically brought new um you know new tenants, and yeah, yeah. and they're they're happy to pay you know 
the the rent increases. So, okay. So on your deals, what type of, uh, of of syndication structure do you do as far as the returns for your investors? How do you set up the ownership structure? Um, you mean in terms of the equity allocation yeah, or? Yeah. Like if I was looking at one of your deals, uh, you know, what does a typical uh, PPM look like? So usually there's a 70-30 split um, on the equity. Uh, we like to give preferred returns as well. And we like to take our asset management fee after all in the, our investors actually receive the uh, preferred return. So if there's no money by the end of the year and we paid everyone, you know, let's say 7% cash on cash, no money, then we don't take any, you know, asset management fee. If there's money there, then we, we charge our asset management fee and anything beyond that is just basically the split. What about an acquisition fee? Uh, 2%. Oh, good for you. So, all right. So, and I say good for you just because that's not greedy. I mean, I've seen, you know, three tends to be kind of, uh, you know, the norm. I've seen five. Depending um, on how big the deals are. Oh, this the guy didn't care how big the deal was. Yeah, he he mm. asked for five. Yeah, yeah. It was, you know, an example of pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. So, uh, you know, and I'll tell you something. If you see a 5% acquisition fee, you know you're not really dealing with a very savvy investor. Um, could be, even though, even though I have to say that my number one advice, well, maybe not my number one advice to past investors, but I keep telling investors, don't focus too much on the fees and the, and the equity allocation. And of course, you know, I, I have, you know, an incentive to say that, but, but yeah. really what I mean is that look at, you know, make sure that you're, you're actually investing in a good deal, because if it's a bad deal, even yeah. 1% or half a percent, you know, acquisitions fee is not going to help you. Yeah. Uh, I was actually talking to someone uh, a few weeks ago and he said, you know, I invested in, in the deal and the equity split was, um, I think it was 88 to 12 or 85, you know, something very, very uh, extreme like this, which means that the, the passive investors are getting, you know, 85% of the equity. And he said, I barely saw any return on that money. I think I got a first check after six or eight months. I don't remember the details by now, but the returns were so ridiculous that it didn't matter. So even if it were 100%, you know, 100 zero, if the deal is not good, if the operator is not solid, then all those numbers don't, you know, don't matter. You know, something, Ellie, I saw one the other day that was 100 zero. Mm. Yeah, and my concern with that, if I was in investing in the deal, my concern would be, okay, so what's in it for the syndicators? Yeah. Uh, when the market turns, what's going to keep these guys in it? Uh, you know, if they know they're Very not going to make point. any money, they're going to run for the hills, and I got to run that property then. Very good point. You want to make sure that everyone has a skin in the game, and everyone yeah. should be compensated so they would care about the deal. If you don't see much, and that's one of the reasons why actually buying smaller properties doesn't work for me because finding a property management company that will have skin in the game and interest to maintain my seven or two or 25 units is harder than to find a company that manages 150 units. They yeah, have yeah. something to lose. You always want to make sure that the person that, that you invest with that is in charge of your money has something to lose. Yeah. I could not agree with you more. Absolutely. So, wow. Ellie, we're coming up on the end of an hour and uh, I could sit there and talk to you forever. I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So listen, ellieperlman.com, P-E-R-L-M-A-N. -E -L 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 my father's old partner was Perlman. Mm. Uh, so it's Perlman. Ellie Perlman uh, in Santa Monica. You're doing deals in, in Texas and, uh, and Orlando. And uh, folks, please go check her out. Get, get on her website and definitely get on her uh, her podcast because uh, we we only got to get to one uh, one story here today. But uh, I'll tell you, there's n nothing more fun than putting a couple of multifamily owners together and telling war stories. And, oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have you on my podcast as well. Oh, you I love to be on your tons podcast. Tons of terrible and, and amazing stories. Oh, I can tell you by the time I did a um, I did a uh, um, a, a, a due diligence down a property inspection down in Texas. I think I was mm -hmm. I was it was it was uh, outside of Dallas, and I one bedroom. When I walk in, the guy is sitting on the on the couch, 
And, uh, you know, I said, hi, we're, we're here to take a look. And I walk into his bedroom and he has a whole row of wigs on his, on his uh, you know, bureau. I'm like, oh, okay. Not you know. shady at all. Huh? Not shady at all. <laughs> Not shady at all. And then, you know, we just look in the closet. We're looking for water, sp- water stains up in the ceiling. And he's, there are a bunch of dresses. And, this, and I look at the shoes, and this is a big person. And then I come outside, and he's now standing up, and he's got, you know, he's obviously going through the, the process. And, uh, yeah, he was my first transvestite I ever met is, uh, you know, working there. Yeah. So that was one, that was one oh, of the Oh, st- that's okay. I thought maybe you were going to a whole nother, you know, direction there with some <laughs> bodies or something. No. Uh, no. Have you done the dead bodies yet? No, not yet. Oh, uh, yeah, we had a couple of not yet. Sad, very sad. I, so. Well, I had the closest that I got was um, working with someone who uh, killed somebody as when I was a lawyer, and I, I didn't like protecting him. I didn't like giving him a better t- – and that was – he was my last case. Oh, so yeah, he'll get you out of the business. Doing other stuff, and that was not – Was this in Israel? Yeah, yeah, back in Israel. Murder in Israel? Jeez, yeah. uh, I thought murder only happened in, in America, according to, uh, you know. America is the best country in the world. Oh, there, are murderers, there, are, there are murderers everywhere, you know, in the world. But I think, you know, what brought me here was the notion of self-made man or self, self-made woman. And I learned about it when I was little and I knew that I would come here one day and uh, make it happen. That is so cool. Well, uh, it's so good. You're, you're the type of people we like to have here, Ellie. Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much for being on my podcast. I'd love to be on yours and uh, let's keep in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me today. My pleasure. Have a great day.